Hey, everybody. <clears throat> Great to have you here for another Inspiring Room Futures. I recognize some of the names in uh, the participant list, and it's great to see you here again. Um, so some of you already know I'm Katie Hurstein from Girl Scouts of Colorado, and I get to be the one to host this Inspiring Futures. And it's been pretty great to see all these different professional women who have been interacting with Girl Scouts since January. And uh, we have a few more left um, in this spring before you all uh, finish up school for the summer. And then we'll be starting back in the fall. And I've got a few interesting ones lined up in the fall. We've got Raina Tegelmeyer, who's a graphic novelist, um, a lawyer. Um, I've got someone who's a, a meteorologist coming on, robotics. We've got some pretty cool ones. And I've seen from your surveys that you filled out, um, you know, just a few more of the professions that you'd like to see. So I'm on that to find some uh, professional women who can talk to you on Inspiring Futures. It's going to be a lot of fun. So keep looking out for um, you know, information on who will be coming up in the fall. So that's a lot of fun. So College Invest is um, a partner that's been working with Girl Scouts of Colorado to bring uh, inspiring futures to you. And they're Colorado's college savings program. So it makes it easy for you to save for uh, funding um, education after high school. So, you know, whether you choose to go to a school anywhere in the country um, for, you know, a, tr a traditional college or you wanna do an apprenticeship program, which gives you real, real world experience or trade school, uh, College Invest will help fund that. So basically uh, it's like a piggy bank where you can put birthday money in, your caregivers can put money in, grandparents things, and it uh, that account builds and grows tax-free. So when it comes time to take that money out to pay for your uh, higher education, uh, you don't get taxed, so your money goes further. So it's a, it's a pretty great way to help uh, save for higher education. So we're gonna hear a word from the CEO of College Invest, but what she helps you get out of today's session. I'm Angela Byer, CEO of College Invest, and welcome to this episode of Inspiring Futures. Through Girl Scouts, you've learned that if you can dream it, you can do it. And here at College Invest, Colorado's education savings program, we help you get there. And you're never too young to begin to imagine your inspiring future. So how will you impact this world? Will you run your own business, invent a new technology, or maybe even discover a life-saving cure? But wherever your inspiration takes you, a College Invest Savings Plan can help make your dreams a reality. Now, prepare to be inspired. Awesome. So next up are housekeeping items. Um, so we, we are recording this. And um, so we will be keeping it up on our YouTube channel. Um, so it, I'll block out any space, any faces before it goes uh, up onto our YouTube channel because that's a public facing place. So um, um, it, people won't be seeing your faces. So love that I can see some of them now. Hey girls, um, and feel free to interact because um, Shannon has a very awesome uh, interactive inspiring futures for you today, which you get to help solve a crime. So make sure you keep those video on, keep your, uh, you can unmute and chat with us. Uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So next up is our promise and our law and feel free to join along with me. Ready? On my honor, I will try to serve God in my country help people at all times, and to live by the Girl Scout law and the Girl Scout law. I will do my best to be honest and fair, friendly and helpful, considerate and caring, courageous and strong, responsible for what I say and do, and to respect myself and others, respect authority, use resources wisely, make the world a better place, and be a sister to every Girl Scout. Awesome. So what we are all here for is to meet and chat with Shannon Daly. So in her, she's had 19 years in law enforcement and she's been a canine handler. She's been a narcotics detective, um, rapid response team member, defensive tax instructor. So what does all that mean? So we're going to find out about all that. Um, her educational pathway, what she and her colleagues did, and we're going to help solve a crime. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen <clears throat> and hand it over to Shannon. Hey, well, I'm going to, oh, there we go. 
There, now I can see everybody. Learned how to do that in the last one. <laughs> so my name is Investigator Shannon Daly. I work for the District Attorney's Office here in Colorado Springs. Um, what that means is that when um, somebody commits a crime and they get arrested and they have to go to trial, I work on the trial side of that. So if there's extra evidence that has to be gathered or if there's extra interviews that need to be done, um, then that's the stuff that I get to do um, and work in tandem with victim services and um, with the prosecution. And I brought some friends with me today as well. So come and introduce yourselves. Hello, um, I'm Nicole Williams. I am an investigator here at the district attorney's office as well. Been in law enforcement for about 12 years. Um, I've been a probation officer. I've been on the task force for the ATF, which is the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, as well as the U.S. Marshals. And I hope you guys all have a good time today. Next. Okay. <laughs> like, no. My name is Cassie. I'm one of the victim advocates here at the district attorney's office and I work in the juvenile unit. Hi girls, I'm Deputy District Attorney Blake Whitcomb. I'm a prosecutor with my office. Um, prosecutors bring cases to trial and try to get justice for victims. I hope you guys have fun today. Hi ladies, my name is Elizabeth Robinson and I'm an investigator here also with Shannon and Nicole at the DA's office. I've been a cop for 14 years and I've worked for the Department of Corrections. I was on patrol for a while and now I'm here as an investigator. Have a good time. Yay. All right. So um, who here gets to earn their badge this time? Who, who gets a, a, what is it, special agent badge? Who's working towards that? Who do we have? Melissa? It's a cadet Everybody badge. So if, if you haven't earned it yet, it's a cadet level. Awesome. All right. Well, we are going to work on that today by investigating a crime scene. All right. So I, I'm going to pick this up and go over to our crime scene. Hopefully, while I'm moving it around, I don't make anybody ill. Um, all right. So. Come on out. <laughs> all right. So you guys are the police officers. You guys are the detectives. So once we get to the crime scene, you guys get to figure out what questions it is that we ask. Okay. So you guys are going to have to participate. People are going to have to come off a of mute because otherwise I won't be able to hear what questions you guys are asking. And then we'll all stand here and stare at each other instead. <laughs> all right. So you guys get, here's your, your crime. You get called to a house that has been broken into and somebody murdered one of the residents who's in there. So you guys get to investigate the murder. All right, are you guys ready? We're gonna we're gonna start at our crime scene. So here is the outside of the house that we're called to. And what do you guys see on this window? Blood and cracks. Yep, blood and blood. cracks. And what do we have down here? More, More blood. blood. More blood. All right. So what do you think the first thing that we should do is? Go ahead, Shannon. Um, maybe like take a sample of it so you can like see whose it came from. Well, if we're very first getting here, what do you what do you think we should do first? Go inside. Go inside. Very good. So we're gonna go inside, and uh oh. Here's our murder victim. What do you guys see over by his head? Blood. 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 Yep. Uh, yeah. And as we go inside, oh my gosh, we found his wife. Oh my god. <laughs> so what what questions do you think we should ask her? Uh-oh, my screen. There we go. What questions do you think we should ask the wife? Did you see anything? Um, well, I was upstairs and I heard someone breaking in, uh, someone breaking the glass. And then I like ran downstairs and I looked and I saw, and as I looked, a woman was running out of the house. So I don't know um, what happened or anything. I don't know who she was. Could you describe her? 
Very good. Yes. Yeah, she was um, um, she was a white woman. Um, she was tall and skinny. She had uh, light brown and blonde hair. Um, she was wearing shoes that had some kind of pattern on them. So that's all I saw. You didn't see her Was she carrying any weapons on her? Very good. I didn't see any weapons at the time. Um, like I said, when I was coming down the stairs, I just saw her run out. So I, don't, I didn't see any weapons. Who else was in the house? Perfect. Just me and my husband and our dogs. Was there any of the dogs barking? The dogs did bark when they heard the glass break. And so in you know, conjunction with the glass breaking and the dogs barking, that's when I got up and ran downstairs. And at that time, you know, found him like this. Do you have any idea what the time was when you heard all this? Yes, it was about 10 minutes ago. Um, and then I called 911, so, and then they got here. You guys came, so. All right, so you guys got a little bit of a description. What do you think that we should do with that description? Write it down. Well, <laughs> yes, <laughs> write it down. But um, yeah, I have other, we have other officers in the department too, right? Yeah, you would also need to call it in. Yeah. All persons call it in. Yep. So we'd want to give the description to our partners. You could take a picture of the evidence. Well, we we will. But right now we've got a suspect who just left a murder maybe 10 minutes ago. So is it possible that they're still in the area? Yes. Oh. What's up? Oh, yeah. You could probably check the area around that, maybe like 10 miles or so, to see if there's anybody that matches the description. Yep. And so we want to we want to let our we want to let our partners know that. How about what what else would we ask the victim? Um, Are you well, doing the time of the murder? Because she said she saw the the suspect run out of the house. But yeah. then what? Um. She also said that she has dogs. You should probably ask like where the dogs were at the time because say a dog were to have bit the murderer the possible murderer then uh you can also like tell like er's and stuff to keep an eye out for things as sure. well. very good do you know, which direction? Very good. Do you very know good. which direction the woman ran out perfect who just said that one where was that laura very good the dog were upstairs with me um so no they didn't bite anyone and um she ran that way she ran out the door and then to the right and she was carrying a, ba a black bag with her Ooh, okay did you see anything missing perfect yes um his laptop was missing he was at the table working um so when i came and found him he, he was like that and his laptop was gone could it have possibly been a burglary gone wrong? Possibly, yes. Very good. How big? All is right, that? so we're gonna go outside. Oops, sorry. And outside of the house, we also see these. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Yeah, we got oh, some nice. footprints. We got some footprints. <laughs> so maybe we have an idea which way the suspect ran. And we can relay that to our other officers who were driving around the area, trying to figure out if there is somebody who matches the description that we put out. So we did that. And we have two people who match the description um, that got stopped by our partners on patrol. So here is our first one. What questions would we ask this person? Yeah, Where black bag with you? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Where were you at that time? At what time? 10 minutes ago. I'm um, just walking around the neighborhood. Did you hear anything? Nope. Do you live in the neighborhood? Yeah, I live over that way. Um, we should also, uh, what's your name? Elizabeth. There you go. What is your What's on your shoulder? Um, I have a bag. What's in the bag? Stuff. 
What kind of stuff? Just stuff. Can we see your shoe tread? Sure. Okay, so we got some cowboy boots. Doesn't matter if she can. No, she could have changed shoes. Very true. Very true. She could have. So who she knows? Who knows why we can't just look in her bag? Uh, you, need to, you need to What's have. That? Do you need to have a reason to actually look in the bag before you actually have an actual like reason why you might suspect that person like something that you could like actually like would be an actual reason then you have to have consent first yeah correct correct because we've got what's called the fourth amendment which prevents us from being able to just randomly search anybody's stuff that we want to we have to be able to give a very good reason give a tie to the crime why we want to be able to look into her bag very very good so maybe we'll go ahead and leave this person with the officers that they're with and we'll go check out the other person and here we go with the other person so what what do we want to ask the other person where were you at at the time of the murder i've just been i've just been walking around man i don't know uh, what's you your name? To, my name's Cassie. Did you happen to be, uh, oh, um, what's in your, what's on your shoulder? I just have a bag. I'm going to my friend's house. They all have Can we bag. see the imprint of your shoe? Of my shoe? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> who, who said aha? Uh -huh? <laughs> me <laughs> all right why why did you say aha uh -huh. what do you think well simple she said cat print shoes and the shoe print just looks like it matches the one we found as evidence by the crime of scene thing yeah my mind <laughs> you get the very idea. nice all right so what else what else could we do to see if her shoes are the ones that match well, we would have to have her step on ink, then put her shoe and have that step on paper. And then we would have to analyze that paper and make it seem as if it, or see if it matches the evidence. Very nice. What is, what is something though that you think you could do pretty quick could on you just, Could you get shoe size? Yes, yes, very good, Cassandra, shoe size. So we would take a look at her shoe size. What size shoes do you wear, miss? Eight and a half. Eight and a half. And then we would radio that back over to somebody who's on scene and say, hey, give me a rough estimate what the shoe size is. And if they say eight and a half, ooh, we're a lot closer, aren't we? Yeah. 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 So what else? We saw some, um, some blood on the, on the cracked window. What, what else do you think would help us tie her to the crime right now? Do you have any weapons on you? No, I'm just going to my friend's house. Uh, can I see your hands and arms? There you go. So we're, I, I didn't actually hurt Cass, so we're going to pretend like she's got a, a scratch on, on one of her hands. So what are we going to look at with that scratch? What do you think? Probably see if there's like any glass in it or anything. If it's like a really jagged um, scratch, then it'd be more likely to be glass. Yeah. Or if we're at, you know, maybe it's now, what, 13 minutes after the crime. So that scratch would probably still be pretty fresh. If it's like super scabbed over and looks like it's already healing, then that's that's probably not from our crime scene, right? We also need to analyze the crime scene again and see what weapon probably caused the murder and then see if she has that type. Yep. Yep. Very good. Very good. So we're going to go back to our crime scene because she's being held. And all right. So what all would we collect from this crime scene. Oh, and the coroner already came and collected the body. Um, so what else, what else from this crime scene would we want to collect? Blood samples. Blood samples, blood samples. very good. Why would we collect blood samples? 
So we can so check then, whether or not it's compare the blood with the with the person's blood and see if it's correct. Yep. Yep. And who else's who else's blood would we want to compare that to? The suspects. Um, the the, yeah, suspect the, other, the other suspects. Well, the suspects. Yeah. Victim, or, possible suspect. Victim. Yep. Yep. We'd want to make sure that we compare that to the victim too. And the maybe one. maybe the victim got hurt because he heard the the blood or he heard the glass break and he got up to try to fight the person who came in and maybe some of that blood is his. What about, we didn't see any on the bottom of, of the suspect shoes, but what do you think? Would we still get the suspect shoes? Yeah, because they can clean shoes. Yep. Yep. So we can, we can take her shoes and we can have her shoes analyzed um, to see if there is any blood on her shoes. You guys see that on TV when they, when they do that and the Q-tip turns like a bright pink with the phenolphthalein? Yeah. I've seen yeah. too many CSI and NCIS for my help, I think. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm gonna set us down so that I'm not making you guys sick by carrying you around all, all over the place. All right, so what else, what else would we do at the scene? What's super important to show, like once this goes to say a jury trial, what would be really important to show the jury? We need pictures. Hey. Yes, we need pictures. We need crime scene photos. So we would, before the coroner came uh -huh. and took the body away, we would take pictures of the whole scene, the body, everything at the scene. Um, what else do you think we should try to collect? Make sure the evidence isn't contaminated. Yep, we would want to make sure the evidence isn't contaminated because what can happen oh. if it's contaminated? Oh. They could basically just screw up the entire case. Yeah. Yep. You could definitely screw up the entire case. Uh, you'd also want to check for like fingerprints, like yeah. I guess like around the table, because if he had his laptop and the person took the laptop, then. Yep. So that will bring us into part of um, how you guys, uh, what you guys need to do for your badges. Do you guys have a piece of paper and pencil? Yes. All right. Take your pencil, color on your paper, super dark, like a one inch by one inch square. Oh no, we need to find a pencil. <laughs> okay. All right, for those that do, once you have your square colored in, take your pointer finger, and rub it all around on that square so that you get all the pencil on your fingertip. Can we use a pen? It's not gonna, it's not gonna work as well with a pen. Okay. And I don't want anybody's moms getting mad at me when they have pen all over their fingers. So once you have the pencil on your finger, then touch a blank spot on your piece and of paper and just set your finger down on top of it. Don't rub it around or smear it. Just set your finger on top of it and then pick your finger back up. Tell me what you see. That was, that was bad. To write. I see a pattern. Yes. A pattern of? Uh, your fingerprint, like a yeah. twirl or something. Yep. So when we go to a crime scene and we try to collect fingerprints, um, nobody's fingerprints are the same. And so we would compare those, like we have Cass wandering around who we think is our suspect. If we get some um, fingerprints off of the table next to our victim, um, we would wanna compare those fingerprints to Cass's fingerprints, right? <laughs> yeah. Let me, let me see your fingerprints. Let me see. Hold them up to your cameras. Nice. Good job. Good job. All right. Who knows? Name me one surface that's really good to get fingerprints off of. Your phone. Ink. Oh, sorry. Ink. 
Uh, <laughs> give me, give me one. Glass countertop. Very good. Glass is very, very good. Um, what about a bumpy wall? No. 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 no yeah, not really. That, would, that wouldn't be very good unless there's something else with those fingerprints. Like if they touched the blood and then touch the wall, that would give us a better chance. But a lot of times if it's a bumpy surface or if it's like the dashboard in your car, a lot of times those are not very good for us to get fingerprints off of. So speaking of the blood, so we've got the blood here. Um, we're gonna collect it. How do we collect it? With a Q-tip and some special liquids of sorts. <laughs> so, hold on, let me find it. All right. So we would take one of these Q-tips that's in a sterile container and see how it's got like a little lid on top of there. That's so there's no other ick in it. We would pop that lid. Just get it wet with a little bit of water, not from a water bottle that you're drinking out of, not from a sink, um, from, we keep little bottles of, of water that have been unopened and we only open them for this stuff. Pour a little bit of water on there, rub it around on the blood, put that back on, and then we put it into an evidence envelope. Where does it go from there? To a science lab to be to a science lab. Uh, yeah, like who who said they were watching CIS? I did. Yeah. So we would we would send it to an Abby Shudo. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wish we all had one that worked that quickly. That would be fantastic. <laughs> Unfortunately, it takes a long time in real life for the blood to come back. Yeah. I've heard yeah. about a week or so. A week? I wish. That would be super fast. More like if it's for a homicide case, maybe three months. Um, if it's not a homicide, you could be looking at six months to a year before before your results come back. Yeah, it's it takes a long time. I wish it was as quick as it was on TV. <laughs> yeah, it's like. very evidential that these shows are very uh, scripted. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I, I, I would even like watch TV as, as quickly as they do on the shows, but it does not. It does not. Um, who, who has seen how we actually take fingerprints? From I have a thing. They have this special kind of tape. So we get these kits that have fingerprint powder in them. A little fingerprint powder spreading brush. The fancy tape to lift the prints with. A ruler to measure them. And some cards. And then on the back, fill out all the information for where you got that print from, what case it goes to, that sort of thing. And just so you guys know, this powder is very, very um, sticky, I guess is the best way to describe it. It makes a big giant mess and it's very, very difficult to get off of stuff. So if you have ever seen, or if you ever go on a ride along, and the police have to go and get fingerprints um, on a crime that they're on. You'll see their fingers, see mine are already turning all icky just from the powder on the outside. It's very, very difficult to get off. Is it like but, flour, but a black version? Um, sort of, yeah. It's, um, this one is called a uh, volcano powder. Yeah, um, but it is just, I don't know how well you can see. Me. Oh, well, now I just built some in my office, but <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you'll find tons of fingerprints there. Uh, yeah, probably, probably. Which actually, so if we were taking fingerprints from this crime scene, that brings up a, a very, very good point. 
if we are taking fingerprints from this crime scene, who else would we want to take fingerprints from? The wife well, and the all the other suspects. And the yep. victim, too, to make yep. sure that the victim fingerprints aren't in there. Yep. Yep. That way we can determine. Oh, thank you. That way we can determine what fingerprints belong to the victim, what fingerprints belong to the wife, what fingerprints are supposed to be in this house. And then, oh, why do we have Cass's fingerprints in this house if she's not supposed to be here and says that she's never been here? Why, why would we not have hers? And why is the suspect in the same room as the crime scene? <laughs> all right. Well, normally she wouldn't be, but we're just all gathering back in this room. <laughs> Maybe in an interrogation room. Yep. I'm not going to talk, though. I was just did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you just did. Yeah. Sponsor lawyer. Yeah. The right to remain silent. Yeah. What questions do you guys have for me about that crime scene? Close that back up. Oh, I saw something come across the chat, but I have all of your guys' pictures up, so I can't see the chat very well. So I need voices. In the chat, it was asked, uh, what classes did you take to get this job and for how long? Ah, all right. Well, 20 years ago, I went to um, a police academy. And when I went, it was 17 weeks. Um, I did not have to go to college first. Um, some police departments do want you to have a college degree. Some don't. Um, but I did not have to go to college first. I do have a degree now, but... Um, my academy was 17 weeks. Liz? Hi, mine was about six months. And mine was 12 weeks. So the academies are different based on when you went to the academy, um, where you went to the academy. Um, different, different states have different rules about how long it has to be. And every year they add more and more classes. And so the academies get longer and longer and longer. What else? Um, why did you choose this job? So I chose this job um, kind of when I was growing up, I was always kind of the person that everybody ran to whenever they had a problem. Um, or if somebody was picking on them, they always kind of ran to me. And so I kind of got into this job to stand up um, against the bullies and protect people um, from becoming victims. What about you guys? Um, actually, I didn't choose this job. This job kind of chose me. Um, I was going to school uh, to get my paralegal degree and then I wanted to be a lawyer. So I went back to get my criminal justice degree and during my internship, I interned for the Department of Corrections, which supervises convicted felons. And then um, they offered me a job. So then I took that job and then I just really loved it. And I loved like working with people and I loved being able to, you know, be a part of putting the bad guys away. So um, and investigating and, and just kind of doing that kind of thing. So that's how I ended up. Hi ladies. So mine is a little different. Uh, I grew up with a brother who, unlike me, uh, did a lot of questionable things and was got in trouble and arrested. And I saw my parents go through all this trouble and trying to help him. And the cops didn't do a lot to help my parents. So my thought was, is if I became a cop, then maybe one day I could help a family not go through what my family went through. So that's why I become a, sorry, became a police officer. Anybody else? Any other questions? This one's more about the crime scene. Um, so I'm guessing in the real thing, you would do more with the victim's body besides just like look at them and be like oh their heads down on the table with blood okay ship them off um so what <laughs> kind of things would you do all right so we would come in we would check for a pulse 
and see if that if he is alive or or dead. Um, if he if we feel a pulse, then we would um, try to do we would call medical to the scene, but we would also try to do some first aid um, and see if we can help keep that person alive. Um, <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> um, if they actually did turn out to be deceased, we take pictures of, of them where they're at. We don't touch the body until the coroner gets there. So if, if the person is actually dead, besides like feeling for a pulse, um, we don't do anything with the body besides take pictures until the coroner gets there. Um, because in Colorado, the coroner is like, they're the ones who determine basically like what happens with the body and we have to wait for them to get there. Um, then once the coroner gets there, then we would check him for an ID. We would roll him back. We would check and see what other injuries he has, take pictures and measurements of those injuries. And then he would get shipped off um, over to the coroner's office for an autopsy. And they would do a, a full and complete autopsy. How long would it take for you to find out the TOD? Is there honey on the table? So, you know, I, I wish it was as easy as like Ducky figures it out on NCIS or who's the, who's the young guy now that Ducky's not there. Palmer. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Palmer. I, I wish it was as easy as they just like kind of take a temperature of the air or maybe stick a needle in somebody's liver and then go, Oh, his liver is this many degrees. So his time of death was an hour ago. It's not quite that simple. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, sometimes it, it can be within, you know, 10 hours. If we're called to the scene right away, obviously that's a little bit easier, but if we find a body out in a field somewhere, um, sometimes they take a look at what vegetation is around that person and what vegetation might be on their clothing. Um, they'll look at the bugs and the bugs, um, that, are inside the body and helping the body to decompose and contact, um, what are the bug people called? And entomologists. Ent entomo ent entomo entomo thank you. Contact the entomologist so that they can tell us at what stage all the bugs are. And that helps us to determine like if, if, the, if the larva are already flies, that might be a week. And so they would say, okay, well, this guy's here at least a week. But it's not not quite as exact and not quite as quick as on NCIS. What's the scariest uh, job you've uh, ever done? Um, scariest. I think maybe canine was the scariest. Um, not because I was as afraid of my own safety, but every time I sent my dog into. Um, a suspect's house or into a house to get a suspect. Um, that that was that was always scary because you never know if you're back or not. What about you guys? What do you guys think? Um, <laughs> um, let's see. I'm gonna it's say <laughs> being um, I was on the U.S. Marshals Task Force for two years, and I would say for me that was scary um, because we would have to hunt fugitives and those are people and they had violent they had committed violent crimes and they had warrants out for them so we would have to go um, wherever and try to find them sometimes it was in their house sometimes we would get in chases on the highway uh, that kind of thing so and a lot of times I had weapons and things like that so you never really know what they're going to do so you just kind of have to be prepared for, for all of that. And for me, I worked for the Colorado Department of Corrections. So I think that was the scariest because there's one of me in, in a unit with 40, 50, 60 girls, you know, female inmates, and there's one of me. So if somebody were to get mad or they were all come after me, then I'm, I'm there by myself. So I think that for me was probably the scariest job, just being one person having to learn how to communicate and deal um, with inmates who are in jail for violent crimes and having that many around you. Good question. Yeah, that was a good question. Yeah. And so um, how many of you guys 
have ever had that feeling on the back of your neck with like the hair stands up on the back of your neck or you get a real uneasy feeling in your stomach and you're like, oh, something just doesn't seem right here. Yeah. Yeah. So we always tell our new cops and our old ones who have forgotten it sometimes to always, always listen to that. If your body is telling you that there is something wrong, there is something wrong. And you have to figure out what is wrong with that situation. Always listen to that. If you guys meet somebody and they make the hair on the back of your neck stand up or they make your stomach upset and something in your in the back of your brain is going, get away from this person, get away from that person. Always listen to your body. Um, yes, on Laura's computer. Um, for me, like now, that's probably true. But I remember as a kid, uh, it was late at night in bed one night and I was really, really tired. Um, and my door was shut and I saw this floating blue clown head with bubbles coming out of his mouth. So I was a kid, it, I was tired. And so I was scared because I was like, why is there floating blue invisible ish? Like, like <laughs> now that would probably tr be true now that I've grown up a bit more, but like with kids, sometimes when they're thinking something's wrong, you want to see what's going on, but you also want to realize like they're kids, they have an imagination. Yeah. Yeah. But I've, I've definitely found that, um, kids are a little bit more honest with it because they don't have the life experience to try to explain those feelings away. I think the older that we get, we go, ah, oh, well, it could have been this, or it could have been this, or it could have been this. And we tend to dismiss it. And for police officers, that can be very, very dangerous. If we walk up to a car and as we're walking up to it, like on a traffic stop, and the hair on the back of our necks is sticking up or something in our stomach is going, there's, there's something not right about this car. We need to listen to that, still be a little bit afraid and kind of work, yes, cautious and kind of work our way through that, slow everything down, take a look at what's going on in that car or around that car, but definitely pay attention to that. So as you guys get older, don't try to explain those feelings away and say, ah, it could have been this, it could have been this. If you get a creeped out feeling being at somebody's house, being, um, you know, you see it, you're walking to school and you see a car that kind of creeps you out. Listen to that. Listen to that. We have a, a question um, in the chat about what classes do you have to take to be able to train and work within the canine department? And what's your oh. what was your favorite thing about working in the canine department? Um, well, my favorite thing was was that dog. Um, my dog's name was Rush, who's a Belgian Malinois. Um, so if you've ever seen the movie Max or what's new one with Channing Tatum, dog, dog, that's a Belgian Malinois. Um, but we had to go through a canine academy. So for three months, we had to train every day together, 10 hours a day. And it was as much training me as it was just training the dog. Um, it was it. It was very long, very hot. Um, but it was, it was a blast. But who, who wants to interrogate? I saw something come across about interrogate. That would have been me. <laughs> if you would like to try to interrogate, um, our suspect. Where were you at the time of the murder? I was not aware of any murders but I was just walking through the neighborhood to go to my friend's house. Uh, why were you going to your friend's house? Because I wanted to hang out with my friend. Who's your friend? Jennifer. Where, is your friend? where does your friend live? In the neighborhood. <laughs> What's the address? I'm not sure, I just know the directions. Can I see the directions? You just turn left on Main Street and it's like the fourth house. The red what house. House. What? What's the color of the house? Red. Uh -oh. Anybody else? Duck? No, how, how far does your friend live from the scene of the crime? Well, where's the scene of the crime? Blah, blah, blah street from blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I don't know. I, I was just going down Main Street. How long were you, have, how long were you walking at the scene? Like, 
how long were you walking before the crime happened? Like, when did you start your walk to your friend's house? I had been walking for like 10 minutes when police officers stopped me, but I don't know what time the crime happened. Doesn't, doesn't work exactly like how it does on TV, huh? If you've known your friend for a while, you should know a few more details about where this person lives or how to get there or what their address is, etc. Oh, you would be absolutely amazed the number of totally and completely innocent people who have no idea of their surroundings, how to get where they're going, how they got to where they're from. You would, you would be absolutely amazed the number of people have no idea what is going on around them. Don't know their own phone number. Yeah. One thing that's not for the suspect, but uh, she said she was walking for 10 minutes, about 10 minutes before the police stopped her. Didn't the crime happen about 10 minutes before we found the suspect? Yep. Yep. Had a girl. So what, um, what do you think we could look at in that neighborhood to try to maybe retrace her steps? Cameras on traffic lights and stuff. Cameras on traffic lights and, and stuff? Like what other stuff? Um, um, oh, phone. cell phones. Oh, your phone. <laughs> yeah, cell phones. Or what, what does it seem like almost everybody has as their door? Ring cameras. You could ring cameras. cameras. Yeah. So we would go and do, what is it called when you go all the way through the neighborhood and you start talking to people? Who knows what's that called? Canvas? Solicitor? Yes, neighborhood canvas. Very good. So we would go and try to contact everybody in that neighborhood and see who has ring cameras and see if we can get copies of their, of their ring cameras. Very good. Um, what about if we confiscate our suspect's phone? What can we do with that? We can see who she's been texting and if it's been planning on, hey, I don't like this person, blah, blah, blah. What do we have to do in order to see that? Well, first we'd have to ask consent. Say she does give us consent, then um, we would, most people have like GPS on their phone, <clears throat> like something like Live 360 or something, Google Maps, so we can go into that and like check that because that, it tracks things. Say she doesn't give us consent and you feel the need to push further to get consent, then you can uh, go to people and like, I mean, if you get enough evidence behind it, then yeah, you can be like, yo, we have. What is, what is that called when, what is the piece of paper that we need that says and, that we get into her phone when she doesn't want us to? It's you a search warrant. warrant. Search warrant. Yes. Yep. Very good. So we would, we would put down all of the evidence that, that we have so far her shoes matching the shoes at the scene. She's matching the description. She even said that she's been in the neighborhood for 10 minutes prior to the police talking to her. Okay. She's got the cut on her hand. Um, she's got the, the black bag um, that maybe, maybe we might need a, a search warrant to get inside that bag too, right? Because what, what could be inside the bag? The laptop. The stolen laptop. Her husband was doing. What's that? Well, there could be, because uh, as the uh, wife, the husband said, the laptop was missing. Yes. Yep. So that the laptop could be in that bag. So all of all of that stuff is what we would put in to warrant to get inside the bag and a warrant to get inside her phone. And just straight up ask, do you know the victim on the phone? Yeah, we could, we could ask if, uh, if so our, our victim was Blake. And our wife was Nicole. So we could ask our suspect cast, do you know Blake and Nicole? Yeah, you can also have what was that? You could also ask the wife in case she's lying. Yeah. Yep. Oh, you gotta eat some chicken. Do you want honey? Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Wow. Would you get into the suspect's phone? What's that? How would you get into the suspect's phone? So we would get a search warrant that allows us to, or do you mean how, like physically how we get into the phone? Yeah. Okay. So there are a ton of products out there um, that are designed 
to read data off of cell phones, laptops, iPads. And so we would plug the phone into one of those software systems and they pull all the information that's on the phone off of the phone and put it onto like a hard drive for us or a disk, depending on how much information is on there, but it pulls all the information off of the phone. And then we don't need a code to unlock it or anything like that. Then we can just go through and start. Mm -hmm. the so on that note, because you guys are young ladies, um, I want to give you my Snapchat spiel. Snapchat is for the devil. Don't play on Snapchat. I know you think that everything disappears on Snapchat. It does not. It may disappear on your end. It may disappear on their end. But if I plug your phone into one of those machines, I get all of the deleted Snapchat stuff. So don't, don't send things that you wouldn't want. Here's your, your best piece of advice. Don't send anything on any type of social media that you would not want plastered on the front page of the news tomorrow morning. Because that stuff does not go away. Ever. 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 Yeah. So basically, yeah. if you're going to plan a murder, don't put it on technology because it could be tracked. Oh, yeah. Yep. Take that. Uh, yeah. Take that away from that. Yeah. <laughs> or Send take letters to each other. That's very inconspicuous. Or talk to people you don't know. Yeah. Or talk to people you don't know because you don't know who they are. And then, unfortunately, I get the cases and I find out who they are and they're not a 13-year-old living in Florida. And then you're talking to me a lot. Yeah. I don't even have a phone. I would honestly love to talk to you. <laughs> I'd love to talk to you, but not as a victim of mine. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I wouldn't so want that. So Cass said that she is a victim advocate. Who knows what that means? What does she do? Oh, come on, someone give me a guess. What, what would a victim she, advocate do? Maybe she, like, has, or they, sorry. Um, maybe they have experienced or seen something before, and they can, like, say, like, oh, yeah, this has happened. Like, I know this, maybe? So close. Okay. What do you think the word um, advocate means? Uh, maybe to, like, you're put out. Or uh, what to, does that mean? Maybe to like put out and say something about it. Maybe they stand up for the like a lawyer for uh, where the was, where did who said stand up and then it kind of faded out after that. Uh I said they stand up for the victim, like give evidence of they weren't there or something. Um so not right. not give evidence that they weren't there, um, because then they wouldn't be a victim if they weren't there. Oh. But they support the victim throughout the whole court process. So if the trial or whatever takes three years to get all the way done, um, then victim advocates help the victims, their families, they support them through the whole process and they get to be like the biggest voice for the victims. But pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> what questions do you guys have for Cass about being a victim advocate? It's a super, super, super important job. Do you like your job? I do. I do like my job. I get to work with a lot of people who have bad things happen to them, but I get to see as good of a resolution as I can for them to get justice. How did you become a victim's advocate? What did you say, how or why? How? How? So I got my bachelor's in criminal justice from UCCS, and then I had interned at this office, the district attorney's office, as a legal assistant, and I wanted to be more involved with cases and more involved with victims, so I applied, and I started in the domestic violence unit, and then I got moved to the juvenile unit last July. Anyone else? Who's frozen with a horse? I'm looking at Autumn's picture with her horse. I, I like her horse, but I don't know if we lost her or not. Oh, no, I'm here. I'm sorry. What'd you say? <laughs> I just said your picture is frozen of you and, of you and a horse. So I didn't know. Oh, if we yeah, this is my profile picture. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah. How many uh, cases? Or what other questions you guys have? How many cases have you done since July? Oh my gosh, I've done a lot of cases since July. I have all the crimes committed by kids that are 10 to 18, 10 to 17, almost 18 in the county. So I have anything from school fights to murders. So I have a lot of kids. <laughs> that chicken and, meat. And, and for me, I have absolutely no idea since oh my God. July. Hundreds, hundreds, thousands, hundreds, 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 hundreds at least. Yeah. yeah. Have you done one in the past month? Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Every day. Every, Every day. day. Multiple. Yeah. So, there's, day. so there's, there's something that we have to do on each of these cases every day, whether it's reaching out to the victims to see if they have any further information or to see if they're okay or see if there's any services that they might need interviews. or interviews of other witnesses that we found, um, interview the suspects. If they decide, okay, now I want, I do want to talk. Um, then we go and interview the suspects. Um, we'll go out to crime scenes and help collect evidence and talk to witnesses and stuff out at the crime scene. So there, there is something that we do testify. every day. Yeah, testify in court. Wow, you just jump up. Fingerprints. Come on. <laughs> we also do fingerprints, uh, like when somebody commits a crime and they have multiple crimes. Uh, we call that a habitual uh, criminal. So we take their fingerprints and compare them to other fingerprints when they were arrested. So we get to go take their fingerprints and then we use a microscope and then we compare each fingerprint to the other fingerprint, and then we write a report saying if we think that's the same person or not. We do a lot of those. We also take, um, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> we also, um, we go down to the jail a lot too um, and deal with inmates there. But one of the other things that we also do um, is take buccal swaps or buccal swaps. Um, that's just where we get the Q-tip like she showed you. Um, is similar to that, and we swap the inside of their mouth. So say someone left DNA at a crime scene, we can compare that to their DNA that we collected from their mouth. So we send that to the lab and have it analyzed too, and that also helps us to see whether or not they were there or maybe committed the crime. Do you guys have to travel around a lot? Yes, but we don't. So we, we are primarily responsible for everything in Colorado Springs and the surrounding area. Um, so we don't we don't get to go to other states um, as often. If we have a suspect that's in jail in another state, then we might go and interview the suspect in that jail in another state. Um, but otherwise, we stay pretty much in, in our area. Well, yeah. Kennedy, Kennedy asked in the chat, um, she said you could also use ring doorbells that have video recordings. Absolutely. And she wanted to know if you've ever gotten hurt. Oh, geez. Um, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> um, but you, you just had to, you just got to keep on keeping on and, and get back up there and keep doing your job to, to protect the citizens. Um, I've been bitten quite a few times, um, punched a few times, kicked a few times, had to wrestle some people, um, broke a rib, broke a couple fingers. I think that's it. So nothing, nothing like terribly serious, but, um, being a, a police officer, you're, you're gonna, you're most likely going to get hurt. Um, at some point you try your best not to, but that, that well, people don't like to be grounded, aka go to jail, and so they they like to fight when you're taking them to jail because they don't want to go. Have you ever tased anybody? <laughs> yep, yep. Um, so who show of hands who thinks when you get tased you pass out afterwards? Oh, perfect, because that is what they show on TV all of the time is that when somebody gets tased, they go fall down and then pass out. You don't pass out when you get tased. That does not happen. You get this part and then the fall down, no, no passing out. So that's why where like, if you watch an actual police officer body camera, instead of just a TV show, 
you'll see as the person goes down, a bunch of the cops go and jump on that person and hurry up and try to get them in handcuffs. That's because as soon as that five seconds is over, they can get back up and fight. So it only, only freezes you up for five seconds and you do not pass out. Um, I have a question. How many cases are you normally handling at once, like for a victim advocate? So it just depends. Um, I have the juvenile cases and then I'm also on the homicide rotation. So all of the advocates switch through and we kind of are on almost call. So whenever a homicide case happens, then we pick that up. So I have, I'm new to the homicide rotation. I only started in October, so I have four homicides. And then I think I have around a thousand juvenile cases that I keep up with. So I'm in court every day, most of the days. I'm in court or I'm in a meeting. Yeah. That's, that's probably around the same for a lot of us as well. Um, we, we come in and we look at all the, all the to-do things that show up on, a, on our computer, all of our, our workflows and go, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> So you've been, so have you been bitten by people and um, pets? I have never been bit by a pet. <laughs> I have only been bitten by people. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's I'm expecting that to be reverse. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? Um, the pets tend to listen a lot better than the people do, unfortunately. <laughs> better well-mannered. Yeah, yeah, the pets are definitely better well-mannered. What techniques and tools do you guys use to keep your cases organized and your flow chart where you can use it correctly? Ooh, so I, I think everybody probably has their own... Um, their own version of how they keep everything straight. Um, I so we we have a computer system that tracks all of all of the cases that are in in the court system, and so we can see all of the cases that are assigned to to each of us and what needs to be done on them. But then a lot of us have big giant whiteboards with stuff written on them, and this is what I need to do next. This is what I need to do next. Um, calendars. I, I have sticky notes everywhere. Um, yeah. I use an Excel spreadsheet and so I have it color coded because I have different types of cases in different courtrooms to be in. And then I also use my calendar pretty religiously to know where I need to go and who I'm with and what I'm going to do. But I also have to call people after court. Um, and so I have to keep track of how they want me to contact them with what happened in court. So I have to use my Excel spreadsheet more. What else? No other questions? Who after all of this wants to go into a career in law enforcement? Wants to be police, detective, victim's, victim's advocate. advocate, prosecutor? I've been victim. wanting to be in the canine unit for a few years now. What's that? I have been wanting to be in the canine unit for a few years. Ah. Well, that is a lot of fun. So you have to start out on regular patrol before you get to do any specialized unit. So you don't get to go, you go complete the police academy, apply at a police department and then go, well, I just want to go right into canine. Um, usually you have to, you have to work in patrol for about five years before you can branch out into anything special. So detective, canine, SWAT, um, DUI unit, yeah, in a in a smaller department, you might get to move a little bit quicker, but um, usually that's that's about right. You get about five years um, on patrol. Oh, who done it? Well, who do you think? You guys are the detectives. I the think. wife. Which the wife? What evidence oh. do you have against the wife? <laughs> Here, look at what? What did the wife do it? I think Let's our suspect is sitting right in front of us. Do you, it's do you think that those shoes created the prints that we saw outside? No. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't see any heel. 
they, they might be close in size, um, but there is no heel print out there. She wouldn't. And then, so we had injuries on our suspect. Do we have any injuries on our wife's hands? Wow. Yeah. No. <laughs> it was Cassie. Yes. <laughs> yes, it was Cass. I do have a question. I was wondering, like, when you guys started your journey of, like, starting these jobs, if you could, like, remember, like, one goal, have you guys, like, completed that goal you had when you first started? Um, you know what? Yeah. When I, when I first started, I wanted to work my way up into the narcotics unit. Um, and so I did about 10 years in narcotics. Um, so that was, that was kind of my goal. But you guys? My goal was just to be there for people and to have, for them to have someone that they could count on to keep them updated and to go with them and so that they didn't feel afraid. That was my goal. Okay. Um, my goal was to be an investigator. So I just reached my goal. I had to go through a lot of different avenues to get here, but it was all worth it. And so I'm happy to say that I did reach my goal. We are happy to have you. Thank you. And I go to see yep. be a detective and here I am. Yay. 15 years later. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, see, so sometimes it, it takes a while. It's it's not something where you just go in and say, hey, I want to be a detective. Hire me as a detective. Got to gotta work your way up there. It takes a while. So it took me, I've been a detective for about five years, so it took me about 10 years to work my way through and and have the experience to, to be a detective. Some people make it quicker, um, but it took me about 10 years. I did take a year off for school. Just, just put that in there. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I'm trying um, to say. No, um, so my situation was a little bit like weird because I previously lived in another state and I moved here. And in the other state, I did like a lot of the ATF and the U.S. Marshals and all that kind of thing. But when I moved here, um, I kind of had a little bit of difficulty finding a job. So I had to actually start at the DA's office as a legal assistant which I had, did have a paralegal degree, um, so that was fine, but it's not really what I wanted to do. And I just had to work through that and just wait my time out until the opportunity came to where I could get to investigations, which is where I wanted to be. So you guys may have to fit, and I felt like doing that, that I was going backwards, but sometimes you may have to do that to reach your goals, so don't ever give up. And sometimes nice. your goals like change. It. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes they change. I thought I wanted to be a cop, and then maybe I want to be an attorney. And I don't know what I want to be when I grow up, but I have a really good job right now, so I'm just kind of trying to figure <laughs> out what's next. I have a question. Yes. I have a question. Was it a purposeful murder, or was it a robbery gone wrong? Well, so think about it. Um, we have a, a suspect who's running around with the victim's laptop. Um, they stole a, a purse from inside the house. They had to break in to get in. So they, that means they probably weren't known to the people who, to the victims who live in the house. Otherwise, why would you have forced entry? If you know them, you're going to open the door and invite them in. Well, but Ooh, even it could have been an accident. Okay. It could have been maybe. Then Maybe she does know him, and they got in an argument, and she killed him. Um, but yeah, say, but say, uh, the victim was in like a position, like a say, a job or something. Like there could be a motive, like depending on like who the victim was associated with. There could be like a reason the the um suspect couldn't directly know the victim but still be like, okay, I need information. And then like either the purse could have been like, oh, well, money, or it could have been, I think your wife might be associated with this somehow. Mm -hmm. or, or like, yep. <laughs> I really watch Yeah, and, and you know what, the, the sad part is that sometimes when we solve a murder, when we find out who it was that did it, 
sometimes there is no reason behind it. Either they're not willing to give a reason or we can't figure out what the reason is or it was just something that was absolutely senseless. There was no reason for it. And that's that's very sad when you can't, who knows what all the all the questions are. The who, what, where, why, when, how. We like to get all of those answered and sometimes we just don't. Some Sometimes you don't get the why. You get all the rest of them. Uh, but if it was um, then why would she have the la uh, laptop? Would she just be like, "Oh no, he's dying. Let's take the laptop." <laughs> well, if she so, let's say that she was just somebody who came to break into the house and maybe thought that there wasn't anybody home, and she wasn't expecting him to be sitting at the kitchen table working on his laptop, and so she saw, "Oh crap, there's actually somebody home," and so she kills him not realizing that maybe the wife is there, steals the laptop and the purse and runs out. And unfortunately, we get a, a lot of crimes that just, like you would think that there's a bunch more pieces that would go into it. And sometimes it's just as simple as that. Somebody was just trying to take something that didn't belong to them and they ended up murdering somebody or assaulting somebody, hurting somebody just so that they could get away. I yes. have a question as a troop leader for yes. you, all you wonderful women. Um, as women working in a male predominant industry, what like tips can you give these young ladies for inner strengths or resources to break into industries that maybe aren't popular, but something they're still interested in? That is an awesome question. So I would say know who you are. Don't compromise who you are to just try to, to fit in. Don't compromise and work 12 times, 100 times harder than what the guys are doing. Don't give them any excuse to say, oh, well, she couldn't do that because she's a girl. Oh, she couldn't do that because she's a girl. Yeah. Don't ever give them that excuse. Believe in yourself. Know your self-worth. And don't ever let anybody take that away from you. Those are things that no one can take away from you is your self-worth. Don't ever let anybody shoot that down. Always know who you are. What do you guys think? Um, I agree 100% with her. Um, for me also, um, set your goals and keep your eye on that. Um, just make sure that you every day you're doing something to reach your goal, no matter how small, or no matter how big, just make sure that you reach your goal. Only surround yourself with people who are uplifting to you. They're gonna be people who are always, you know, have something to say about what you do or don't like what you're doing, but always just surround yourself with other people who are uplifting you um, and, and making sure that you reach your goals. Um, but it's really up to you. So just make sure that you, you know, champion for yourself. Um, also for me, um, I'm a very, very visual person. So I do a vision board and every year at the beginning of the year, I, um, I'll get a big poster board that, you know, you do school projects on or whatever, and I'll get magazines and I'll cut out things that I want to accomplish for that year, um, in different areas of my life. So I do that. And then I put it in my room and then I look at that. I can see that every single day and that helps me. It can be quotes. It can be pictures. Um, and, you know, different things like that. And I, I can see it every day. And then when I'm feeling some kind of way, or if I've had a bad day, or even a good day, I'll look at that. And I'll, you know, be able to, it'll renew me. And, you know, I love quotes. So I also have a dry erase board that I write, write different quotes on. So just, just, you know, surround yourself with good people and believe in yourself. That's awesome. Thank you. Okay. And for me, I agree with Shannon and Obviously, when they're called, those are great ideas. But the biggest thing for me, I was in the Army, so very male predominant, career field, DOC is the same way, and so it's being cop. So what I would say is, no matter what, ladies, no matter what, don't ever let anybody tell you you can't do something. Never, ever. Amen. Like, that is it. You have a goal. You work towards it. I don't care if you have to take a step back to keep going forward. You do what you need to do. And never let anybody tell you otherwise. All right? 
And if you ever need to talk to somebody, always like this is my big spiel. This is my thing. If anything ever happens to you or if you feel bad or negative, always, always talk to somebody. Never be afraid to go to a counselor or your teachers or even if you're your parents or a family member is a tell them how you feel okay good and by the way i'm super impressed you guys are very intuitive and yes awesome job yeah yeah you guys um, have been i have a question yes have you guys ever been shot at when you're like investigating um, so not since I've been an investigator, um, but when I was on patrol, when I was in narcotics, when I was in canine and when I was on the SWAT team, um, yeah, we got, we got shot at a, a few times, unfortunately. Um, I have also, um, when I was with, with the Marshall's task force, um, we, I had a couple of incidents as well. But I saw something come across the top and then it, it went away. There was something in the chat. No, any more, any more questions? I do have a question and it's for Liz. I was like wondering if um, you were talking earlier about how you had a goal or if you ever had a case like what your family went through that you'd want to make sure that didn't happen to that family. Has that happened where you were able to help? Um, I've had a couple of juvenile cases, not the same, the same thing my brother did, but I mean, yes, the parents, when I was on patrol, I had that, the parents didn't know how to deal with the kid. They had a lot of issues and I was able to go over there and kind of be like a buffer or a counselor. And you do a lot of that when you're a cop. You, you are, I always say that we should have a degree in psychology or counseling because you are just, you are a counselor to an extent. Um, but yes, that I've, I've had several juvenile cases like that where I was able to help the parents and uh, get through the trauma and then the juvenile to get help. So that juvenile did not continue down that, uh, what society considers a bad path. That was a good question, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Um, you were asking earlier about on um, the top of the screen in the chat, I put surround yourself with the people who are on the same mission as, your, as you. Absolutely, absolutely. And don't, don't ever be afraid um, as you go through life, you're going to find different groups of friends um, that that want to be with you at different parts of the journey. Don't be afraid when somebody doesn't want to keep going on the journey with you. Don't be afraid to leave them behind. You can you can try and say, hey, we're we're all going in this direction. Let's all go. Um, but sometimes sometimes people think they have the same goals. And as life continues on, those goals change. Um, and you gotta, you gotta keep putting you first. You gotta, you gotta do what's important to you. Sorry, I have another question, but like how long are your work days or how many hours do you guys usually work a day and how many hours do cases usually take? Um, so cases take years. Um, so we'll just, we'll go, we'll go with that. <laughs> um, but we, we work eight hour days, Monday through Friday. Um, unless a homicide officer involved shooting or some other major case happens at night or on the weekend. And we each rotate being on call, um, just like Cass said, with being on call with the homicide team. And when that stuff happens, then we get called out nighttime, weekend, whatever. Um, when you're working patrol, you could be working any shift. You could be working midnights. They're usually 10 or 12 hour shifts, depending on the agency. Um, all night, all weekend, no holidays, that kind of stuff. So, like, last week, I was on call. It was my turn. Yay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Thursday, there was an incident that happened. So, my boss called me at 10 o'clock at night. I had just laid down. He's like, hey. Uh, so, I had to go to Colorado Springs Police Department, and I got there around 1030. Nicole was actually there 
Uh, and then we did a bunch of interviews. And that is very good. Be who you want to be. Uh, we did a bunch of interviews and it was three o'clock. Yeah, it was three o'clock. Yeah, it was about four before I fell asleep. And then I was up at six because I had to be at work the next day. And then I worked all the next day. Actually, I worked an hour over. So <laughs> like I had two hours of sleep in 48 hours. So I mean, it does happen, but there's other days where there's less. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like everything's okay and there's less to do and you get a little extra sleep. <laughs> so it, it balances out. <laughs> yeah. Whoever's second, I like quotes too. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Anything are else? you are you allowed to like wear all types of earrings and like all different shirts and stuff? So we have to dress um, business casual here. So like suit pants. Um, today today's our our dress down day. So we get to wear jeans. They they give us that little bonus every now and then. We get to wear jeans. Um, but otherwise, we have to dress like we're going into court. Um, so, you know, nice, nice shirts, jackets, um, suit jackets, that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. If you if you are an attorney or um, victim services and you wear a skirt or a dress, you have to wear pantyhose in the courtroom. Um, no, no bare legs. Um, we all wear where all the investigators, we all wear pants. Um, because you don't want to end up rolling around with somebody wearing a skirt. Because <laughs> we carry weapons, so. We can, we can yeah. wear earrings, not on the road, though. Like, on the road, you maybe, like, a step. Yeah, here we can get away with a little bit more wearing earrings, um, like Nicole's got. Um, I, don't, I don't wear any, but I spent a long time on the road. You don't want to wear earrings on the road. Some departments don't let you wear them. Um, other ones, you can wear, like, a, a stud in each ear, and that's it, or a small hoop in each ear, and that's it. But you got to think if you end up fighting with somebody and they punch you in the side of the head and you're wearing a stud earring, then the back of that earring is going into the side of your head or the side of your neck and you could end up getting injured through that. So a lot of the, the women that I've worked with don't wear earrings at all on patrol. Yes. Kennedy. Have you ever killed someone before? I have not. Thank you. Thank God, I don't ever want to have to do that. Um, I, I never met a single police officer that has ever said, wow, I really hope I get to kill someone today. Um, it's incredibly traumatic. It's very difficult to go through. It's not like it is on TV. Um, so I, I'm very happy that I have never um, been in that situation before. No, I have not either. And I, I, I haven't either. Think, thankfully, no. Yeah. I don't carry a gun, so. <laughs> um, Anybody? I have a question. So, uh, like, at the beginning of working, it's probably, like, pretty enjoyable, but after working for, like, such a, or after working for a long time, is it still enjoyable for you? I absolutely love my job. Um, I, I am... Even on days where I'm like, oh, I don't feel like getting up just because I don't feel like getting up that day, I'm still happy to go into work. Mm -hmm. I, I get to stick up for people when they're at their most vulnerable points in their lives, when the worst things have happened to them or happened to their family, and I get to be part of what helps them, um, hopefully what helps them heal, um, and that's, that's what keeps me coming back every day. Um, the other part of that is this office that we work in is awesome. Like if I come in and I'm not having a great day, I can go sit in Cass's office and she'll start telling me some jokes and make me laugh. Um, or, you know, Nicole will come into my office and be like, Hey, you know, you look kind of like you're down today. Let's, let's sit and talk. And, you know, kind of, we cheer each other up. We, we get to have fun. Um, it's, it's not always work, 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 and don't ever get to have fun. Just go to training and be roommates. Yeah, <laughs> um, but we, and we have we bring food a lot yeah. of times and we have like little get togethers and lunches and stuff like that. And sometimes we'll get a group of coworkers and go out to lunch and stuff. So I know it all sounds fantastic. So we we all have previous experience on patrol. So we do these things to like keep each other motivated and to keep our spirits up, because sometimes what we do see is hard for us to deal with. 
Um, so like, but a lot of cops are, we are a family. Like when you're in a department, you will do things together or you'll have barbecues together. You'll spend time together that it is a, a community that really supports each other. For victim advocates, we go through a lot of emotions and we are with people through a lot of emotions. So we practice really good self-care with whatever that looks like. I like to do yoga and weight lift. I also like to draw. It just depends on how I feel that day, but you have to have something that makes you feel yeah. mm -hmm. better and calm and normal so that you can keep going and keep being what you need to be for people. I have a question. Sure. If you could, if you could tell yourself one, like a younger version of yourself, one thing before you got this job, what would you say? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, hmm. Wow. So somebody else want to um, jump in while yeah. that one's spinning what? in my head? So for me, that's a great question. So for that, for me, like. That the biggest thing is, is like, I am in a male, I really am in a male dominated workforce and I have been my whole life. For me, that thing to tell my younger self is don't doubt yourself. Like you have so much self doubt and you have people telling you different things. Like that would be the biggest thing is I would just tell myself, don't give up. Mm -hmm. No matter how you feel, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. Just keep going. Talk to somebody. Do what makes you feel better, like better, like Cass does yoga. I do CrossFit on my days off. I instruct it, like that makes me feel better. Just don't ever, don't ever, ever let yourself give up on what you want. That would be what I would tell myself. Uh, what would I tell my younger self? Cass, do you have anything? I would tell myself to keep going even when it's hard. I mean, mm -hmm. there, I'm this job is great and it's fun and you're great, but it does get hard and there's times where you feel like you maybe can't keep going or maybe you didn't choose the right thing. And I think to tell my younger self that it is worth it and we are making a difference and being worth it. I, I guess maybe for me, I would say um, to be careful who you put your trust into because not everybody who acts like they're on your side actually is. And all three of those things <laughs> for me. <laughs> <laughs> what else? So I do have another question, and this one can be like a really weird question, but um, if you guys like have to, if you guys have to go to like jury duty or something, or like something you have to go to, and let's say you have like you have to go to court for like a case or something, like. Do you cancel that, or what would you guys do for that? Oh, well, so I was just summoned for jury duty. I did not end up going. I still have to go, but they ask you a lot of questions of, have you been involved in a criminal case? And then if, depending on how far you get in jury selection, they might ask, do you know these people? Well, I know everyone pretty much, so I would immediately be discounted, but I don't think that they'd want me on a jury because of where I work. So I wouldn't last long in selection. They, yeah, they usually don't keep cops on juries. Yeah, yeah, a lot of the, particularly the defense, they don't like um, cops, prosecutors, victim advocates, they don't, they don't like them being on a jury, because um, we have a tendency to side with the victims, because um, that's, that's our job is to protect the victims, so we, we don't end up having to sit on a jury um, very often, the majority of the time when we do, it ends up being a civil case, so like, you fell down and broke your leg at school and you're gonna sue the school because it was icy and they didn't do enough to get rid of the ice. So we would, we could potentially be called as a juror on one of those cases. But as far as anything criminal, there, the defense would be awfully silly to want to keep somebody who's law enforcement, victim services um, on a jury. Especially when they work for the district attorney's office. They ask yeah. you on the, and the summons you have to fill out, are you married? How old are you? What's your name? And ask you where you work. And so I'm pretty sure when the defense attorney saw that I work at the district attorney's office, they'd be like, you're free to go. And I'd walk back across the street and go back to work. So. <laughs> yes. Are, oops, are you allowed to carry other weapons other than like a gun or a taser and stuff? Um, so 
we also have um, pepper spray um, that, that we can carry. Um, on patrol, you also have like a baton um, that you can carry or some agencies have a PR24, which looks like a baton, but then it's got another handle sticking out of it. Um, I know there are still some that carry nunchucks, which I think is crazy, but also kind of cool, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you think you would be doing if you didn't have this job? Mm. Ooh. That would be a veteran. <laughs> She's got it. <laughs> there you go. So when I was younger, um, my mom was president of the Humane Society or vice president of the Humane Society in Alabama. Uh, so I always wanted to be, I wanted to be a vet when I was younger, uh, younger, younger, before I decided to stuff with my brother. So I would be a vet. <laughs> I would be an interior designer. Oh, nice. there you go. Okay, I am a person who likes like everything in the world. So <laughs> one minute it's this, one minute it's that. So there are a lot of things. I would be um, a photographer, a party planner. So event planning, um, I would be, um, I like exercise. So probably a yoga instructor or something like that. I don't know, uh, just a lot of different things. So. Yeah, I think um, I've always been an athlete, so I think I would probably be some type of coach for um, taekwondo, hockey, soccer, softball, not not basketball. I'm too short, and I was never very good at basketball. So. <laughs> 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 right? But yeah, I'd, I'd probably be some type of some type of coach or like a, a gym teacher coach. Yeah. What else? Um, I do have another question. So you guys have mentioned like going to Colorado Springs a lot for some cases or questioning. I'm also wondering if you go like anywhere else in the state, like really far or like Grand Junction or like somewhere really far or are there other places you go? We, we do if there is, um, so if the crime happens in the fourth judicial district, which is El Paso County and Teller County, um, then it's our case. But if there are victims or witnesses, um, you know, anywhere else in the state that we need to talk to, we would go to wherever they're at and talk to them. Or if they're in a correctional facility somewhere else in the state, we would go to that correctional facility and go talk to them. Um, if there's a pattern crime. Um, so if we see a bunch of break-ins in our area and then now like up in Greeley or Grand Junction or one of those places starts getting a lot of break-ins that have a similar theme to them, a similar MO, then we might go up there and start working with their detectives and see like, hey, what evidence do you have? This is what we've got. Let's see if we can put this together and figure out who our suspect is. Anybody else? And do you guys like, I guess you mentioned like finding witnesses and stuff like that. Do you necessarily track them down or stuff like that? And how, when you, when I do mention tracking them down, how would you do that? So um, we, we have to spend a lot of time tracking down witnesses um, because either the officers on scene didn't get a good phone number, email address, home address for them or they've moved and they didn't up they didn't update their information with us and now we have to track them down um, sometimes we use social media to um, figure out where where they're at or try to get in contact with them um, we have a bunch of other law enforcement databases um, that you have to be law enforcement to get into that um, oh good thank you bye <laughs> bye, Dina. bye. Um, but we've got a bunch of databases that we can kind of get into and, and try to figure out where all these people went to. So that's, that's kind of like what McGee does, but not nearly as fast and not nearly as cool. <laughs> How long do you guys spend dealing with cyber crimes? Um, I mean, I deal with a few. Um, Sometimes people post bad photos of, or inappropriate photos of other people, and that's considered a cyber crime where there's a victim. So 
I have a few cases like that, but it's not, I don't have that kind of case very often. Yeah. But that's a, a, lot. a lot of times those, um, like where you see hackers getting into different computer systems and that sort of thing, um, a lot of times that falls under um, more the FBI than the local authorities. And they have a lot more really cool tools that they can use to kind of track that sort of thing down. Um, and, and we just don't, we don't have the resources or the expertise really to, to go through that. That was a good question. All right, I know we have a ton of good questions. We're, yeah. we're running over. So I, <laughs> I apologize to everybody for running over. Um, any parents that are in there, thank you for letting us run over and, and keep, your, keep your kiddos, keep your young ladies. Um, are there any like final questions before everybody disappears? No, I was just going to comment that I, I live in Douglas County and I know that um, Douglas County has a youth program where um, I actually even pulled it up while I was listening. It's called the Youth Explorer and it's for 14 to 20 year olds who are interested in law enforcement and they can um, you know, just learn about the jail and learn about things. And I'm not sure if other counties in Colorado have the same thing. Yes, yes. Yep, yeah. So yeah. where, whoever's left, um, where, where are you guys-ish at? Is everybody in Colorado? I know we do have some some kiddos that are not in Colorado. Um, my troop is up in Larimer County. Okay, so Larimer County does have explorers, and so does Greeley. And I know the undershirt. <laughs> yeah, so um, the the explorer program, some, some places call it cadets, some places call it explorers. It is so much fun. You get like your own uniform and duty belt. Um, you get to go out and ride with the officers. You get a bulletproof vest. Um, you get to like all the crime scene stuff that we did here, much more in depth and hands-on. And then every year there is um, basically a tournament and all of the Explorer programs, cadet programs, they all get together and they compete against each other mm -hmm. to see like who has the best program. It's so much fun. Right. The, the Colorado State Patrol also has a youth academy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, neat. I'll make sure I, I email that out um, when I send you know an email out to all the caregivers after the event. I'll include all that information in case because it seems like these Girl Scouts have been awesome and asking questions and they're yeah. really curious. Yeah. 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 Great. The question is wonderful. Yeah. I know Daphne Very is impressive. In, uh, Colorado Springs, just Daphne's right in your area. Oh, okay. Oh, yep. So Essex County, Colorado Springs, and Fountain all have um, cadet or explorer programs. Cool. Lots of fun. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. I know it's been uh, late for you, and I really, really appreciate um, all the information you've given the girls. And um, girls, you've had some amazing, amazing questions. It's very impressive yeah. everything that you've thought about. Really, really neat. Yeah. So.